Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Okay, PTTID. My feelings is I think that this project has long been needed. We've got weighted gun belts with uh, metal guns in it and bulletproof vest and, and our full uniform. We want them to be comfortable enough in the water to be able to survive that and get back out. This is not your typical tree farm. He's doing the hard things on this property that most people don't want to get involved with. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. Here at the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in the shallow bays of the Texas coast, you can find one of the rarest birds in North America. the endangered whooping crane. This is a species that almost went extinct. I mean, it was, just, it was almost gone forever from the face of the earth. Depending on what estimates, we can count on 14 to 16 individuals were alive in 1941. And that almost disappeared. I mean, we still have a very small population, 300. A species that was almost gone is slowly coming back. Yeah, there seems to be a gap. Meet biologist people. Felipe Chavez Ramirez, <clears throat> veterinarian Barry Hardup. So something we made out of necessity, I guess. And biologist Dave Brandt. They were here. They hope to do something that's never been done before. See how he's got one foot in, don't he? To trap adult whooping cranes. The plan is to put transmitters on the cranes and track them with satellite GPS technology. The team is working with Wade Harrell from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're going to learn a lot in terms of new places that they use that we didn't know about before. So I think there'll be a real paradigm shift in how we manage and conserve whooping cranes going forward. It's like they may not have come until later in the morning. The first step is to get the birds to come close to the trap. Looks like there they're approaching. And there they say, hey, there's a good pile of corn here. Let's have breakfast. We've been baiting these birds for three weeks now or more getting them to the spot right in the middle so they have to reach and the whole key to this is the fact that they're not quite comfortable the trap that we're using right now is uh, basically a, a leg snare i put wet sand along the sides uh, it's basically consists of a, a loop uh, made of monofilament that we put in a hole that we've previously made on the ground then we start baiting that depression and hopefully they get into it and start behaving the way we need them to behave for actual capture. All right, see you in a few. While Felipe climbs into this blind, so there's a lot of birds in the area all of a sudden. Barry and the rest of the team stage in a nearby truck. So now it's a waiting game. The hope is this study will help answer some questions. Something about you know how they're growing up. Are they are growing up with a lot of problems, uh, and that's why there are so few of the cranes? Or is there something that you know we can do beyond you know working to conserve their winter and and summering habitat? Are there some additional steps that we can take? On this evening, the whoopers didn't fall for the trap. Even another 10 or 15, I guess, and yeah, then call it a day. We'll call it. Ah. They never went for the corn. 
trapping may have hit a snag. There's a family there out there. Can you yep. see him? Yep. But some science on surroundings is underway. What we're doing right now is doing a habitat assessment of the area. Go. Uh, we're going in to look at the different vegetation types to see what kind of uh, areas right. the whipping cranes like to stay in. All right, stakes in. How many segments have any vegetation covering them? Four. Okay. This is just an easy way to get a general idea of the thickness of the vegetation and the height of the vegetation. Even though they are an endangered species and they've been worked on for a long time, okay. uh, there's not a lot known about what they prefer to do on their day-to-day -day activities. So this kind of helps yeah. us get a little better data on where they're actually spending their time. Five. Okay, got it. And one thing the habitat study shows, the crane's health goes hand in hand with the health of this salt marsh. Salt marshes are extremely productive ecosystems. So there's just an enormous amount of uh, crustaceans, crabs, shrimp, small fish. So there's a tremendous food resource that they rely on here. Right out there is our marsh. If you look, they're feeding on blue crabs. Bordering the salt marsh of the refuge is the Johnson Ranch. Diane Johnson and her family have put the land into a conservation easement. The easement ensures that this land will never be developed. We have a conservation easement because we want to preserve the habitat for the whooping cranes and for all the other animals and keep this bit of land natural. It will never change. Our land is on St. Charles Bay, which is 240 acres of wetlands for the whooping cranes. This prime coastal habitat will always be protected. We're surrounded by nature, and I think it's our duty to keep that going. I mean, to keep that wild. I think it's important. Importante. Across the bay at the refuge, it's early morning, and Dave is in the blind. OK, boys, get ready. Got a bird, got a bird. Got a bird, got a bird, got a bird. Got a bird. Oh. You see the flagging on your right. That's right here. Yeah, I think you have the dominant male in your hand. Okay, good. Okay, PTTID 134349. We attach these with two types of adhesion. First one is glue, secondary will be pop rivets, so it's pretty much a permanent transmitter. My feelings is I think that this project has long been needed. There's been, you know, a very little information, uh, scientifically concrete information that's been gathered on these birds. This is enabling us to really concretely say or specifically say, yes, here's where these birds are stopping, here's how long they're spending here. So it's some groundbreaking stuff. Taking a look here to see what kind of uh, condition his feathers are in, his flight feathers. These are his uh, outer primary. What we're doing with capturing adult birds on the Aransas Refuge has never been done before. 7.24. So we're learning a lot about these uh, birds in terms of their movements, their survival, their overall health, what we can do to further their protection and conservation into the future. OK, we're good. You can go now. <laughs> oh yeah, he's good. We've got a pair of whooping cranes here. One adult here in the pair is uh, green over black, color band, blue uh, radio band. I think they're doing well. In all, the team banded 37 adult whooping cranes. 2107. This project gives us very fine scale, detailed habitat information. So we can actually go and look at locations where the birds have been, find out what type of vegetation is there, what type of food sources are there. So we really begin to better understand what the birds need day in and day out 
from the nesting area in Canada all the way down here to Texas. This is the last stronghold of the wild whooping crane flock. Uh, so it's very important from that perspective. This is the, the core. I'd really feel a connection to it, and I, and I would like to do as much as I can to help the species. And I think this is one good way to get there. It's two minutes! These Texas game wardens are hitting the water, which isn't easy when you're wearing 20 pounds of gear. There you go. We've got weighted gun belts with uh, metal guns in it and bulletproof vests and, and our full uniform, boots, everything. Six Texas game wardens have drowned in the line of duty. This groundbreaking training aims to change that. This is to give them the skills to survive falling into water. If they're boarding a shrimp boat, getting from one boat to another, falling in. Good morning, stay game warden. Yeah. Respond to a flooded situation and slip and fall into the water. Sure, I'll hold on to it, Landon. Um, somebody fights them and ends up in the water. Stay back, stay back. We want them to be comfortable enough in the water to be able to survive that and get back out. <laughs> Texas game wardens are some of the first officers in the nation to receive this specialized training. You can rupture your eardrum during this evolution. It's based on real life situations. The first part of the obstacle course, it's to simulate being under a boat hull or in a boat cabin caught. Then they will swim and hold a volleyball to simulate somebody's head above the water, a small child above the water, any object like that. A Little bit farther, a little bit farther, come on. It is a very physically demanding class. Push through it. It's totally different than wearing just a bathing suit. I mean, it's all added weight that's just dragging you down. You don't float like you normally would with just normal swimwear on. You start sinking a lot faster. Keep going, you're almost there. This training is helping everybody overcome that moment of panic to show us that we can do it and instill confidence in us. And while they may not win most graceful, ultimately they could save lives. These are the skills that they're developing so that their name is not on a plaque on the wall. Push through it, come on. The sun coming up through here, through the trees, it makes a different, different shadow. Everything's beautiful. I mean, I like the whole place. Trees are real pretty, and the, and the native grasses we got. Well, I like all of it. But the whole place, I like the hills, the trees, the wildlife, and uh, riding around with, with puppy just up in the front seat with me, and just looking to see what we've done and what we're doing and what we need to do next. Because it's always something to do. For Winston Bay Ranch, most of it, we do try to harvest timber. It's just an ongoing thing that's been going on since my great grandfather had the place. And we try to manage for wildlife, for turkeys and the deer, and songbirds, and all the other kind of birds. And when you drive in the gate, there's a sign that says tree farm. This is not your typical tree farm. It's, you know, if you, when you drive around through here, the woods are open. There's a lot of prescribed burning going on. There's an invasive and exotic species removal. He's doing the hard things on this property that most people don't want to get involved with. This good looking long leaf stand, it was planted in 2005. Mr. Winston had clear cut the previous timber off the area and then did a reforestation job using the longleaf seedlings to establish this stand here. And this is a really nice stand. It, these trees are thriving, and a lot of that is credited to Mr. Winston's management. He contacted us uh, to aid in helping establish some of these perennial warm season grasses on his property to improve turkey habitat. And it allows turkey poults and bobwhite and other game birds and small animals to forage on the ground in between the plant stools. But with the site prep that Simon's done on this area, 
we're able to accomplish basically a complete stand in a single growing season. Not a lot of fuel. One thing about the Winstons, they're real hands-on. And the Winstons have been doing prescribed burning for several years now, 15, 20 years. And the reason for that is uh, twofold. One is to reduce the, the fuel reduction for fuel reduction purposes. And the other is for uh, wildlife habitat enhancement and, and development. We uh, keep it burned out. And now they do it in blocks. And he, uh, Simon has it all on a computer. But uh, we used to just burn whatever needed burning. And, and so then he started doing it more organized. This is one of the main management tools we do all the time to help help the land where everything doesn't grow up and, and where it won't have forest fire in it. It's good for the turkeys and the deer and food for them. Come on, puppet dog. Let's go. Get out. Let's go. This is uh, one of our spring food plots. If you just take a little time and do some research or some kind of program or project that you'll get assistance on that you can do. We have Jace events out here, which are young kids. They'll come out we do, and we do wheeling sportsmen's for uh, handicapped people. I, I enjoy doing it. You got to love what you're doing. To me, it's not, not work. If it was work, I wouldn't be doing it. You can tell he has a deep, deep-seated care about this property, and he seems almost willing to do anything to, to get it the way he wants it. We're never finished. You can always improve on what you got. This property is a, an example and serves as a good role model to, to other properties in East Texas on how to manage uh, timber and wildlife simultaneously. No, I just have lots of good people that help and family and. Bless, God bless to be here. He did a really good job because the guy who put it together. Thanks. These folks are all members of a volunteer brigade at Paternales Falls State Park. Each year they put in over 15,000 hours. They're the ones who keep the place humming along. Oh, this is the real exciting part of the day. Someone's got to do it. This is uh, the job I would rather have here than any of the other jobs, because when we're done for the day, we're done for the day. So I get this job over with, go and enjoy those hiking trails. We're pretty proud of our restrooms here. We get a lot of compliments on the cleanliness and what have you. All done, Sheriff. OK. The state's really having a tough time funding their state parks, and so they appreciate what we have to offer for them. You ready? Yep, I'm ready. So they do their best to make us feel comfortable, to feel welcome. Did you get that cigarette butt over there? I did. Not a week goes by that they don't stop at the campsite and say, we really appreciate what you folks are doing. Every morning, uh, we need to know who came into the park after the office closed. Early each day, Floyd makes his rounds to all 70 campsites. When the people left this morning, they went off and left their fire burning. And all his work is a huge help to the full-time staff. Well, it uh, gives the park employees time to do jobs that uh, I don't know how to do. Uh, to give them more time to do their ranger jobs. Floyd isn't issuing tickets, just reminders to check in at the park headquarters. Uh, I'm done for this uh, campsite check. We'll go to the office and turn the report in. Good morning. Morning. How are you this morning? Oh, I'm just right. Okay, we got a few people came in last night. We have a campsite 5, 28, and 54. And their ticket shows 413. And we're all set. And did I get a paper this morning? Yes, sir. 
You are a fine American. Phil McDonald is a park ranger who is thrilled with the volunteer program. You have a list of things to do. It's like honeydews at home. You know, you always got your list of honeydews. And no matter how hard you work at it, it always seems to get longer on you. Well, when the volunteers comes in, you can turn them loose. You give them an idea, get them the material, and they'll just go and do the project, and it's fabulous. It's wonderful. The park has an average of 16 volunteers at any one time. That's the equivalent of four full-time positions, essentially doubling the number of people working out in the field. How can I say this? And without the volunteers... We wouldn't be able to keep the infrastructure up in the park. And in a park, infrastructure is everything. Pedernales Falls covers 5,200 acres. That's over eight square miles. <laughs> and on a busy weekend, the park attracts more than 2,000 visitors a day. The size of a small town. It's a gorgeous day to be out here. I don't think the public realizes actually what goes on behind the scenes. You know, they come into the park, they see all the wonderful sights and the places that they can go and visit. Man, that tree is big. But they don't realize what it takes to keep the park operating. And nothing is more important to a park than water. Paternales Falls has its own treatment plant which can process over 100,000 gallons a day. When we don't have volunteers to do specific jobs, it takes time away from me and the water plant, which sets me back on doing my job. Ready to go check the campsites? And the volunteers allow me to do my job to the fullest and to the best that I can. I was, uh, when I first come here, I was really unaware the parks uh, had that many folks uh, participating, but you know, it's really working out great. And it's that gonna look nice. You did a nice job on these frames, Ron. That one there. Bill McDaniel is the manager here at the park. All right. The work they do is a tremendous benefit to the staff because it saves them a lot of time. It allows us to actually provide a higher level of customer service than we could normally provide. Meanwhile, Sherry and Vern Metzger have cleaned their four bathrooms. But they have one more chore before finishing up for the day. Uh, let's see, let's start right here. When you start putting the peanut butter on the one end of the feeder, you'll have a little orange crown warbler hop up three feet away from you, you know, just hopping up and down, waiting for you to put the peanut butter in there. And then a ladder back woodpecker will fly up and land on the pole, and it's, it's really cool. Plus watching some of the people is pretty cool too. Oh yeah, they get so excited when yeah. they see those birds, you know, three, four feet away. <laughs> As the day winds down, park visitors are streaming in for what will be a very busy weekend. Here comes a camper. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. We're here to camp overnight. Got two adults and two children. Just a day pass. Day pass. That will be $5, please. Wow, we're getting a line. How about that? Saturday night is full. Sunday night is not. Of all the parks that we've gone to, this is the one we prefer coming back to the most. You walk beside the bathrooms and down the steps to the swimming hole. And the staff treat us like we're important, valuable, and that's also a key. It, it makes you feel like you're doing something worthwhile. How fun, sir. Bye-bye. He did a really good job. Thanks. <laughs> and so we close where we started with a group of friends resting up after a hard day of work. And that's a good thing, because tomorrow morning, they'll be doing it all over again.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.